Every episode of The Angry Chicken is made possible by our amazing patrons over at patreon.com slash tag. For more of Jocelyn's content, check out jossplays.com. And if you can't get enough of Ridiculous Hat, follow him over on Twitter at Ridiculous Hat. The Angry Chicken is a production of A Move TV. Time's up. Let's do this. You smell like a leopard gnome! I knew it! The podcast about Hearthstone and Battlegrounds. This is The Angry Chicken! Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Angry Chicken. I'm your host, Jocelyn, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Ridiculous Hat. Hello, Hat. How's the last month been treating you? Ah, you're back. I'm back. back. You're back. <laughs> I missed you. Don't ever leave me again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you did it's an okay. amazing some... job while I was gone, though. Like, the guests that you had, the episodes you did, so good. I, like... I should have just stayed away, honestly. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to run OBS. Yes, but oh, you just need me you. for streaming. You just need me to run the software. I get it. I see. No. Now it comes I, out. I need you for laughter, and I need you for happiness, and I need you for, yes, the behind-the-scenes work, and I need you for puppy <laughs> updates, also known as pup dates, which we will get shortly, and I need your, your, you are the angry chicken. So thank you for <laughs> the kind words about the shows that we did, and like, yeah, we had some amazing guests, but like, now that you're here, it's home. We're back That's home. That's true. That's true. It does feel like home. I missed you guys. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a, a well, I mean, I was gone for like a month. Um, didn't do much. <laughs> So, like, I don't really know. Like, I mean, I watched every Marvel movie back from Iron Man through Endgame. <laughs> oh, boy. Which, which was the worst one? Um, I actually enjoyed them all. Like, they all have their ups and downs. Like, I know people don't like Dark World, but I think it's actually fine. <laughs> oh, it actually, fine that's exactly not true. What it is. I skipped the Guardians of the Galaxies because I don't like those. So, I guess, really? <laughs> yeah, I guess technically those are my worst, but, you know, to each their own. It started because I wanted to watch one. Captain America. And then I was like, well, you know, they start talking about the Tesseract. And so I should probably go back a couple of movies just in case. And then it just became a whole marathon. I watched like all the seasons of Downton Abbey. <laughs> I watched, oh God, I've watched so much TV. That and napped. <laughs> Napping sounds delightful. Yep. Uh. I just, I took it easy. I relaxed doctor's orders. So... <laughs> I'm glad that you listened to the doctor, even though it's against your very nature. It was so difficult. You have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to hear everything that happened in Hearthstone because I have been a little bit like, I, like uncomfortable and sick. So I haven't really been like sitting up at my computer and like playing stuff. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, I don't really know. Like I haven't been keeping too much up with like what's going on. I know like rip marks, but outside of that, like what's, what's happening in Hearthstone? <laughs> That's the thing that you know about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, mostly because I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's literally okay, that my does reaction. Sound really plausible. <laughs> yeah, uh, really. Yeah. Okay, I get it now. Yeah. Yeah. I think you called it as well, like pretty early on. That's all right. So the most important thing that's been going on in Hearthstone is uh, is the support from our epic patrons, who you can become a TAC patron by going to Patreon.com/tac. It gets you access to the TAC Discord server. Thank you so much to ADC4 for upping your pledge. Really appreciate the support. Other than that, See, well, you're such a pro. Like, I totally forget to do the things and you're just like, ah, 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 Joss, <laughs> there's a thing we have to do right now. Pay attention to the notes. <laughs> You'll get back in the horse and then I can be the one derailing the show after. But for now, you you earn this. You get You get this right when you come back. But we do have to talk about a little bit of news. I'll catch you up. We get some news. Get some news. Good news, everyone! Oh, no. Nax is out! Nax out! <laughs> been again. a while since we've been... Yeah, again. <laughs> I missed that meme. Yeah. <laughs> it's... 
I had to explain it to a surprising amount of people because there are a lot of people really? that started playing Hearthstone. I, well, do you I know when so. Nax came out? I don't know if I want to know when Nax came out, but <laughs> I want to guess like 2015. 2014. No! <laughs> July 2014. Oh, man. That was eight and a half years ago. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, well... Almost nine years ago, uh, it came out before Hearthstone had a mobile client. So you think about just how many people never experienced Nax out memes, except for after the fact, it being repeated. Well, yeah, for like Seth, every really yeah. not Nax Ramis. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, like, I actually had to do some some etymology, some meme etymology here. Like, where did Nax out come from? I didn't know specifically, by the way, because this was like. This is before I really started playing a lot. It turns out that because the Nax announcement and then launch were both delayed, mm -hmm. and when it was supposed to come out versus when it actually came out, there was like a week delay, and we didn't know when it was going to come out. So apparently people would just come in streamers' chats, like Forsen's chat, and just say Nax out, and Nax he would out, open Nax the game, out, yeah. <laughs> and it would not be out, and he would get mad. And like, this is really plausible to me that Forsen would get mad after doing something dumb, after trusting chat. Like, yes. this is all, that's how it, it worked back then. Yeah. Oh my God. That was so long ago. <laughs> a long, long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Forever so, ago. So that came out along with, you know, it came with a fairly sizable patch. Uh, Mercs has been, as you said, sunset. Uh, what else? I think there was actually... a new hero in BGs, right? Because I, I found that out because I logged in and played BGs for a match or two. And then I was like, wait a minute. This is new. What's happening? <laughs> so you've been gone for five weeks i'm pretty sure the undead tribe came out since after your last appearance on the show i think you're right because <laughs> i so don't think it's been five happened. weeks of undead oh man it's this is the fifth week oh, okay yeah so yeah you're i think your last episode of the one uh, i had pocky on pocky was on right to talk right. about bgs because that was the launch of bgs yeah, yeah so Okay, well, Undead, it, they're here, which nobody saw coming after March of the Lich King and Standard. <laughs> they, like, no one had any idea what was yeah, going to happen. Yeah, totally out of left field. <laughs> it turned out to be Undead. Um, and I will say the vibe of Undead, the feel of playing with these cards in both Standard and in BG's really distinct mechanical identity. A lot of Reborn, a lot of this, like, shambling horde that you can never really kill. And if you try, they keep coming back stronger and stronger. I think one of the better class mechanical identities they've ever done. Um, and it's consistent between whether you're playing constructed or whether you're playing BGs, which is really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm, I've enjoyed Undead in BGs. They were a little overtuned, but I mean, they came out with the fix pretty quickly. So I think that's fine. And uh, yeah, I've generally enjoyed it so far. Um, I think the the most interesting thing for me is just that there's so many minion types now and i i kind of waffle between whether it's like interesting and cool or frustrating because i'm kind of starting to have the same problem in bgs that i haven't constructed when there's just too many things to play is the meta becomes like too hard to learn and it's like there's so much variety in the lobbies now because we're up to 10 minion types yes yeah that was the 10th yeah, so you so, can have two lobbies back to back with none of the same. Totally tribes. different. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, and so the different combinations of like what minion types are good versus other minion types and what your lobby looks like and stuff is way beyond me in terms of like levels of BG strategy knowledge. So I, I find like that's been a little bit difficult to kind of keep up with. Uh, but I still like I just go in and don't really care how I finish and I have fun. So <laughs> which is distinctly different than constructed <laughs> constructed. I feel like I should always walk in and just win. So I get very frustrated, very fast with constructed. But BGs, I don't care about my rank. So I just go in, have fun. <laughs> Expectation to the thief. Of joy. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I really yeah, enjoy uh, dual type minions as well. And I, I have more. um yeah, I just, I really like them. I have, like, 
again, because you have so many lobbies with different minion types that the dual types show up twice as often, right? So I'm way more familiar with the dual type ones than some of the other ones. So uh, yeah, but I, I have been enjoying uh, BGs and I have been playing since the mini set. I have been uh, back in standard. So I did uh, dabble in Evolve Shaman, don't hate me. And then now I've been playing some Frost Death Knight, don't hate me. <laughs> you're doing research for the show exactly it's very important that's what you said i had to play because it was busted so you guys can blame hat if you came up against me on the ladder today <laughs> and also unholy is good now and so like you get to play some unholy too so after which always some has frost, been my uh, green. yeah that always has been my favorite type of uh death knight like once it actually launched and i got a chance to play with it um i really really liked unholy so i'm glad that it's finally in a little bit of a better place because it was the worst type of death knight for a while there were a bunch of things that had to get pulled back and a bunch of other things that had to get pushed a little bit forward and now like i will say standard this year has definitely been a little turbulent because there are a lot of times where it feels like the patches that last the least amount of time are the best ones and we're often waiting for a stabilized meta um because the best patches are usually six weeks into a set when they have plenty of data they understand what to do and what to tweak and then the mini set comes out two or two and a half weeks later and just blows it all up again and then they don't get to make another six week patch so that like middle of the full release meta is the one that i usually like the most and it's the one that lasts for two and a half weeks so we don't get it very much um I will say I think the mini set has some interesting cards, but the format right now is we're we're waiting for a patch because this <laughs> format right now is not particularly balanced. It it has interesting things going on, and I do think there are some sleeper decks and some other strategies you can try, but it's pretty clear that DK and Shaman are way over the top. Uh, and in particular the minion heavy frost DK, the minion heavy aggro frost DK. We're gonna talk about that in the strategy section for this week. Um it's really hard to find a bad matchup. If I zoom out to every Frost DK deck on the on HS Replay and include the entire expansion, I can find one unfavorable. And it is a warrior deck that nobody's playing. Okay, I was going to say, I think I lost to a Curse Imp Warlock, but they got pretty lucky and got all their stuff and i didn't draw my deck in the right order. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, you yeah, can like still it lose, happens, right? Like for it's, not, sure. it's not yeah. guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, but like I knew nothing favored. about yeah I knew nothing about how to play the deck at all I played again both Frost DK and Evolve Shaman obviously I'm a little bit more familiar with Evolve Shaman because it's not a brand new class and a blend or a brand new archetype but um I sat down with both those decks not knowing the meta not knowing any like crazy combos or anything and I got a lot of wins I think I was 71 percent with Frost DK and then like in the high 60s with Evolve Shaman and I was like these are probably broken <laughs> like I know enough that if I'm this disengaged with the game and I can just sit down and start a game and get a win that uh, this is probably needs to be toned down a little <laughs> it it could be your natural talent no. which I wish to give credit to <laughs> but also yes these decks are broken yeah they're broken yeah <laughs> and, so and there's some other things you can do like uh, like I want to point out this is not an unsalvageable format, and I've been climbing with Shadow Priest because I want to, because I like <laughs> that deck with an undead Shadow Priest. And over the last two days, I am I am twenty eight twelve with it into top five hundred on America's Ladder, like beating a lot of Death Knights. You can play other stuff, but if you want if you want to win, you should probably play Frost DK. And if you don't want to play that, you should probably play Evolve Shaman. And if you don't play one of those two, then there are things you can try. There are the things that maybe counter one of those or both of those, but lose to the other stuff. Um, but there's nothing that's anywhere on their level. I see uh, we're looking at HS Replay now, and I see a couple of mage decks, a big spell mage and an aggro mage. Are they finding much success? It looks like they're over the 50% win rate, but... I don't think I've seen a mage. Um, I basically I've just seen I've seen Paladin, the pure Paladin list. I've seen uh, the Curse Imp Warlock, and then other Death Knights, the other Death Knights and Shamans. That's basically all I've seen. So, so do me a favor, click last three days in Legend. Small sample, small game size, but just just this <laughs> here. 
Ta-da! <laughs> Yikes. There are four decks above the 50% win rate mark. Frost DK at 56% win rate. The next close is Evolve Shaman at 52%. Then Quest Hunter at 50.3%. That's a small sample size, but the deck is okay. Uh, Curse Imp Warlock at 50.2%. And then that's it. Uh, and by the way, as I said, Shadow Undead Priest, fifth place, 49.84%. The deck is close. Really close. But while these are small sample sizes, this is w largely the field that I've been running into. I haven't actually seen that many Hunters or Warlocks. It's just DKs and Evolve Shamans. Uh, a few Unholy DKs, a few Blood DKs. Maybe like someone trying a Priest here or there with the hope of farming the Evolve Shamans and out healing the DKs. But it's pretty limited. Now... As you go lower in the ladder, as you saw, as you explore other rank brackets, there are other things you can try. The mages are okay. Uh, you can play a Shockspitter Hunter or a Pure Paladin or whatever. Um, and if you run into someone that isn't playing one of the two outlier decks, you can have a ball game, right? You can, you can do something there. And the mages in particular and ping mage is actually pretty decent now too because you have solid alibi. You can prolong the game. You don't lose to minions as much, and you're able to slow down the Evolve Shaman scams and not die to Bloodlust. That's really the thing, is if you can not die to Frost from Suri and not die to Bloodlust, then you're probably okay. But okay is the best you can get right now. So what is it about the mini set that kind of gave us this, like, ridiculous kind of meta here where we're seeing so few decks that are above the 50% win rate? Like... I know, obviously, um, Death Knight's got their new location and their new Colossal, but, like, is there something else that's kind of created this situation? Like, something that we can easily point to and say, like, buff that or delete that <laughs> that might give other classes some more options? Is it just a power level thing where Shaman and Death Knight are so much more powerful? Or are there some specific, like, problem cards from the mini set? Uh... It, there are some specific problem cards. <laughs> uh, like it, some of it is a critical mass thing. So with DK, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, construct quarter of the location is local bananas insane. It is three mana location, three charges, uh, and the ability is to destroy a friendly minion and get a four five rushing undead. So it's destroy, not transform. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was transform. Yeah, I thought it was transform when I first like looked at it. And I was like, what? This doesn't seem that great. But then I realized it was actually destroy. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is a little bit cuckoo bananas. <laughs> Especially when you yeah, consider the, the egg from, I guess that was, that wasn't um, Nax. That was Lich King, right? Lich King. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we've had it for a yep. little while, but this is like... An egg activator on steroids. <laughs> an egg activator, as oh. you will. Yeah. <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> no, I missed you too. Um, yeah, it's like, it's just, it's something on the board that it gives you an activation for your location and another body. And you can do it on turn two, like turn one egg, turn two coin quarter. That's seven, eight in stats on turn two, four or five of it is rushing. And also, do you remember at any point in recent Hearthstone history, where four or five rushers that came down too early and dominated the board were too good. That sounds vaguely familiar. <laughs> yes. Rogues. <laughs> and also, for the other deck, can you think of any card that was maybe too cheap and had Knoll in the name with Rush also <laughs> caused problems? Just once or twice. <laughs> so, so last year was not Year of the Hydra. It was Year of the Knoll. Mm. Right. It was year of the knoll. It, the entire year has been dominated by a knoll of some sort. It just it's just how it is. So in DK, like Frost wasn't supposed to have big bodies. It was supposed to have all the minions. If you'd play if you played Frost before the mini set, you had a bunch of two twos and maybe three threes if you got lucky. Like school teacher was your best minion, mm -hmm. except for Frigidara and then uh and the five five from Frost from Surrey. You didn't have any beef. And now you have a bunch of four fives that just show up whenever you want. They're just there. You activate your vizier whenever you want because you can just pop an undead, pop a harbinger or whatever, a chill fallen baron. And you just have all these four fives. And now you have the beef to actually pressure. And you have the corpses to activate things like marrow manipulator, which is a six mana pyroblast if they don't have anything in the board. It, yeah, it that card is, is pretty crazy because that was one thing that we were talking about when Frost first came out 
was kind of the lack of corpse generation, right? Is that like, sure, you have this potential pyroblast on turn six, but like what Frost DK actually has five corpses to spend by turn six. And previously they didn't really like you might hit the hero power once or twice, but most of the stuff that you were doing was spell based. So you weren't really building up a board and building up a corpse count. But now I'm like, she's always all golden and glowy and <laughs> giving me 10 damage. So it's never a problem. Yeah, it's ironically, Frost DK was the worst early game DK because you just kind of played a bunch of tutus and didn't really pressure the same way. People could out armor you, mm -hmm. they could out heal you, they could set up, they needed to do something, but you could realistically lose to like a ramp druid because they would just gain a ton of armor and then do stuff and you couldn't really pressure them quickly enough. That's over now. Like Frost has minions and corpse generation, so a lot of the weaknesses are shored up. And it's really hard to fight on board against a deck with Frostworm's Fury, especially when it can go get it, <laughs> because Sn Snowfall Guardian with Charge is pretty good against a bunch of minion decks. So it's just kind of been a perfect storm there. As far as Evolve Shaman, Evolve Shaman has metered out a little bit. It's not a healthy play pattern, but the win rate is no longer quite as sky high. First of all, there was a bug that was pretty significant. Um, Goldshire Knoll, targeted with Blazing Transmutation could get Neptalon, the Colossal. Colossals are not supposed to be in the Evolve pool. Oh. It was accidentally included. Um, and so that meant that you would see these screenshots of a turn two or turn three Neptalon. And like, that's too fast. <laughs> I had no idea that they weren't supposed to be in the Evolve pool. I guess it makes sense because, I mean, they're so powerful. And even when they're summoned, they, they you know, they bring their bits. <laughs> so I can yeah. see how... <laughs> I don't you don't like love that? that? No. <laughs> I, it's what they do, but I. It, hmm. <laughs> no, to like they're bringing in the bits. Okay, <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> I mean, you're you're not wrong. Like, I, I guess I just Z lag just has this big bag of tentacles that he just dumps on you as soon <laughs> yeah. as he sees you. It's just kind of kind of slimy. Anyways, um, it it also causes a bunch of other problems. Like, you don't want to evolve something and then randomly your board is completely full of stuff you don't because. If you evolve into an Ozomat or whatever, then your board is just full of different tentacles. Colossus have a lot of tentacles. We gotta talk to somebody about that. Um, <laughs> it's like you just it's fill your board with a bunch of deep, junk, right? <laughs> yeah, and so many so. deep things have tentacles. <laughs> That's. Oh, okay, that one I did on purpose a little. <laughs> okay. Yeah feel uncomfortable anyways <laughs> uh like you don't want to randomly fill up your board with a bunch of crap because like you just you do one of all and it's like all right my turn is over i guess this wasn't really what i wanted or it's really powerful because you get everything you did want there are a lot of tension points that make sense to say all right let's just not deal with this so they just don't deal with it because also if you evolve into it in a full board and then you don't get the appendage then the thing yeah. just doesn't do anything right so they pull them out of the evolve pool but they forgot this one and it turns out the 10 mana colossal is the one that rushes and wind furies, and if you don't stop it, then it hits you for 24 the next turn, which is too much damage. So they bug fixed that last Friday, which I'm glad they did. Um, and also people figured out if you load up your deck with a bunch of single target damage agnostic removal, you can run this deck out of stuff. So you can play like Quest Priest with Lighted Burns and Shadowward Ruin or whatever. You can play Obliterate, which thank goodness that card got buffed. Um, there are ways to deal with that with Evolve Shaman. Like, it's still a powerful deck. It's still format warping, but people have found ways to address it. There are no effective ways right now to address Frost DK. Mm. Uh, so that's a little different. But the deck got really, like, it, it got so much, so many more tools in both a more consistent dis uh, Evolve with Discover and a better target with Thaddeus, which is really, really powerful to Evolve into because if you have one mana floating after you Evolve into Thaddeus, you just play a Glug. And that's really powerful for one mana. You don't say. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so when so, do yeah, you, I mean, when do you think that we might be seeing some changes, some some patches, some bug? Well, maybe not bug fixes, but balance changes, anyways. Because it sounds like we're we're not in the greatest spot right now. I've been enjoying Frosty K and Evolve Shaman, but I'm sure that my opponents aren't necessarily <laughs> i just kind of picture everyone else has been playing so much more than i have so like what is new and shiny to me is like probably rage inducing to the rest of the community 
I mean, I, there is some value to be found in this metas. There is value to be found in many metas where things are not necessarily the most balanced, right? It's okay for there to be a small outlier or even a big outlier. People are enjoying it. The new class is good. They should rein it in, and they're gonna, right? They should pull it back. Uh, but there's still, like, some fun to be found in the play patterns out there right now, and I I feel confident there will continue to be development, but, you know, they need to pull back Contra Quarter. Um, and they need to figure out something to do with Evolve Shaman, and really, like, those are the two strategies that I think are the clear outliers. Everything else feels pretty close. There's not a lot of other stuff that feels like it's really, really off, um, except for a warrior in the down direction. Sorry, warrior. <laughs> Again, we're sorry. Um, but I, so there was American holiday on Monday, uh, which means that the soonest they could patch, if it was like an absolute, like super fast patch would be Friday. Uh, cause the normal period after a mini set or after really any set nine to 14 days, usually if they drop on the Tuesday, it's the following Thursday or the Tuesday after that. So because of the holiday that shifted a day. So they could theoretically patch on Friday if they figured out what they need to hit on Tuesday and they got it going through the process. I don't know if that's what happened. I don't know if we'll finish the process. And also some news that I don't think we're going to dive too deeply into, but that also that patch has to be QA'd. And the QA department right now ha is facing some significant uh, headwinds internally with company culture and morale. Uh, so I don't know how that fast is such a moving. diplomatic way to put it. And like, I don't want to like dive too deep into it or whatever, but like, yeah, that's a very diplomatic way to put like your boss's 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 boss <laughs> thinks you haven't picked a viable career <laughs> doesn't take your department seriously. <laughs> it's it's not great, and I want to point out that I, QA is game dev, customer service is game dev. Games could not function without these departments, and we really respect and appreciate their work. But also, I understand if their work is a little bit hampered right now, mm -hmm. and I would be in the same spot. Um. So I would anticipate Tuesday. I would anticipate next Tuesday, uh, the 28th, could be faster. But if it is, we don't know about it, and they would have had to have moved pretty quickly on it. I don't think they need to hit too many cards. So it, it's possible that it could be Friday. But as of right now, I would bet against it. Not a lot of money, but I would bet against it. Hooray, that means I get a whole weekend still <laughs> to play the stuff Maybe. that everyone else Maybe. is. Maybe this is non-binding. <laughs> non-binding, no internal information. It's don't blame this on me. Don't credit me. Like I don't want I, I don't know. It's okay, don't worry. No one said information. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh we also had some price changes uh during the twenty five point four update. And uh I kind of understand what's going on here, but I feel like you're going to probably be able to explain the situation a little bit better. But basically, um, there were a lot of price increases on Hearthstone's in-game items for countries like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Georgia, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Um, so they were across all platforms and stores, and I guess they were um, going to resolve any issues that they found uh, pretty quickly after the patch released. Um, but a lot of people were pretty upset because in some cases they were, you know, increasing prices by three and four times what um, the original price had been. So uh, this, I think we chatted about this a little bit last week when it happened, um, but you think this is based on the lack of China servers now? Because we, we you can't play Hearthstone in China officially anymore, right? Correct. So um, we don't know everything here, but what I have heard from, from my sources that are in touch with the Chinese market, and in particular, Benage, who was one of the... Uh, he did some localization for Blizzard, I believe, in the past, and is pretty connected to the Chinese community... There's this thing called uh, heart, Argentinian at Heart, where it was the country with the lowest currency conversion. So they would VPN in and buy all their stuff in Argentina. And I am not an economics, I'm not an economist, I'm not a, a socioeconomic professor. Uh, I try, I have tried to figure out what's going on with the Argentina economy, and that is a different universe. <laughs> like, it is very complicated and very hard to understand. I was um, like, yeah, that is a whole rabbit hole that we're not going to go into because, nope. yeah, no. <laughs> 
we are not qualified. Simply no. Put. But <laughs> there are two ways to price your game. You either price it based on the country where you make it, or you price it in the countries where you sell it, and they are different models. And that means that if you price it at the country where you sell it, more people can buy it because it's relative to their cost of living. But that means that people VPN in and buy it at the lower price, and they are getting your product for cheaper. The theory here is that after the China server shut down, that all the displaced players had to buy a second collection, which is not great. And so they went to the place that was the cheapest to do that. And and the population the of Argentina be, went up by thousands of people in a day. <laughs> yes. And there was a very public post about air quotes bot accounts that were banned which were all on the America server with addresses in, in Argentina and Chinese email addresses. <laughs> like, they made a post and showed the domain names and the username counts. Like, they put, they put the heads on, the, on pikes around the town to send a message. <laughs> like, they don't, they don't normally make it that clear, but it's, cl it's very obvious there is a belief that's hitting the bottom line somewhere. And so they have cracked down in a major way, and they adjusted all of these prices with the patch that the mini set was in. Argentina prices went up seven times. Brazil prices went up two and a half times. So a lot of these players are just priced out of the game. Like I said, you can, you can price your game two different ways, either based on my currency or yours. But in this case, it used to be based on the country where players lived, and now it's based on American currency. And that is a big change for people that were already invested. Mm-hmm. And I understand that there is an opportunity cost of, of money being left on the table from people that have to buy a second collection or finding a way to do so cheaply. But it's a second but collection. A They've already bought a whole collection yeah. once in China. Like, that's the thing I think that, that gets me is that, like, whatever money, if, if you're assuming that this is done because of the increase in Chinese players VPNing into other countries, like... That was your own damn fault, Blizzard. Like, <laughs> manage your partnerships better. You closed down an entire market. They had already paid their money for Hearthstone. If they're now buying cheap cards, that's extra. Like, if you hadn't closed down their client, they wouldn't have to spend that money. So you would have been getting zero dollars. Now at least you're getting Argentina amounts of dollars, which is more than you would have had otherwise. Like, I, I don't know. I struggle with this a lot. If if that is the reason, because it's it's they're making Chinese players buy all of their stuff again, and now I'm saying like making them buy like again. I I don't think you could like you can't play Hearthstone. You're not supposed to be able to play Hearthstone in China, right? So that's a whole other like access issue. Is should these players even be doing this? Um, but anyways, like that aside, if we are looking at players trying to maintain their hobby, their you know like they want to play Hearthstone, then this is bonus Blizzard money. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's... I don't know exactly what happened. I just know that I have a bunch of friends that live in these regions and they are really sad and they aren't going to play anymore because it costs more than they can afford now. And that makes me sad. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, I don't run a business. There's probably a reason why the people in charge do. They're probably good at business. But this made me sad for my friends that live in Argentina and Brazil who aren't going to play anymore. Uh, and the other regions, like a lot of the other regions, seemed more like just correcting errors. Like there was the the five dollar bundle in the UK was off by like fifty cents. It was cheaper to buy four hundred ninety nine rune yes, stones yeah. for pounds. So they only changed that bundle by like twelve percent. In Japan, the cost changed by like five percent. Th those are just. They're not news. It's not interesting. It's just a currency conversion adjustment. But in the countries where it changed seven times, seven times, like if the mega bundle cost the same as my mortgage, I would stop oh, playing. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So if, if they applied that to Canada, then my mega bundle would go from like $100 to $700. Like, <laughs> that's insane. Oh my God. <laughs> So it, I, I understand why the players are upset. Um, I can follow how the meetings went internally at Blizzard if this is what happened as to how they landed here. I don't love where they landed, of course, but I understand if you're in a business meeting making business decisions, this is consistent with ABK. Yeah. And this is consistent, unfortunately, with the Blizzard, uh, the, the high-level business Blizzard that we found out about over the past few weeks. Um, 
it's not surprising. It just sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, it really feels to me like they're punishing the wrong people here. And I don't necessarily know how you, you know, get around it when people have tools like VPN at their disposal. But at the same time, like maybe you just let it slide. Because it seems like now they're going to lose, like they might get the money out of the Chinese players who are pretending to be from Argentina, but the actual Argentinian players or Brazilian players are now not going to give them any money going forward. It just seems like the the people who are playing Hearthstone from those countries, honestly, are the ones that are being punished. And that just never is going to sit well with me. So it's it's a really unfortunate situation. Yep. You are... I agree with you on a moral ethical level. <laughs> From a pure business standpoint, if you increase the prices seven times, you only need one seventh the customer yeah. base. And a lot of people have already established their accounts there via VPN. So if they want to keep buying, even if you lose six sevenths of your audience, that's so gross. You make the same amount of money. And most likely, you make more than that because they wouldn't have acted this quickly if it wasn't that big of an impact. Uh -huh. So it's entirely possible that this change makes them more profit. Still gross, still unpleasant. <laughs> I was like, I, I know you're mathing. I know you're mathing at me right now. And I just, I hate it. I hate it. I, it's making yep. all of the business sense. And I just, I hate it. It's gross. I just, That's why we're podcasters <laughs> and not VPs. <laughs> it's true. true. I would never, yeah. I know I would never be able to make a decision like that ever. I did like, <laughs> I, did, I don't I have mean, it in me. I don't have it in me. So I'll never be a billionaire, I guess. <laughs> I could do it in civilization unless there was like a really sad dialogue box of one of the characters <laughs> afterwards. And then I wouldn't be able to do it. Right. Like a dialogue box would be enough to stop. Yeah. Let alone real people. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. One more news story for you guys tonight. Uh, it's kind of a little one. They haven't really said much, but they are having a wild summit at Blizzard. So I don't actually know if this is all internal or if they're because they, they do these from time to time where they have summits and they bring creators in. Um, Matt London on Twitter talked about it and seemed like it was maybe just internal to Blizzard, but you, you never know. Anyways, uh, Matt said, uh, recently we've seen a lot of passionate conversation regarding the Hearthstone Wild format. Uh, today we kicked off a Wild Summit, which is a big internal discussion about the state of the format and how we can bring you the best possible experience. Wild has a lot of moving parts. It's unlikely adjustments will happen this week, but we're committed to building a great plan for Wild and sharing more info once we do, which is like the most we've heard about Wild in a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's... So the vibes around Wild right now, at the competitive level in particular, are poor. They are not great. Um, with that being said, I believe the vast majority, well, the vast majority of any player base is not at that level. And also the Wild is a weird place because you've got three different formats and three different player bases, right? Two of them are smaller. They're closer to the competitive end. They're tuned into the meta. It is half people that want a curated format where they can play their old cards. Half of it is people who want the most powerful format possible with all Hearthstone cards ever. And then outside the competitive bubble, the vast majority of wild players, I like these cards, I want to play with them, don't touch them. The vast, Which I, vast majority I was gonna say, play the same thing. I kind of fall into that realm. I don't play wild very often, but when I do, it's because there's a specific deck or a specific card or something. Then I'm like, I don't get to play with this anymore. I want to go back and and like I want a Doctor Boom. <laughs> like that's that's just what I want to do today. And you know, like a lot of those things aren't actually viable. But I love that there's a format sitting there in my client where all of the cards that I have ever played with are available to me to play with again. Like, that is the wild player that I am. <laughs> yeah, it's... I haven't hit Legend in Wild for a while. Like, there was a point where I pushed it along with Standard because I wanted to. That point has passed. Um, <laughs> but now, like, I'll go in there every so often because I'll see something that looks fun, right? Full Outcast Demon Hunter. Take every card they've ever made that says Outcast, throw it in the deck, and just play them all. And it's goofy and super medium. And it's, it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. So, like, 
I, I I think there's a lot of value in that format, but you only see that outside of the competitive, like the 10x and above level. And it's really fun. But if you're highly engaged and you get out of that bucket, then all of a sudden you're just, we are past the tipping point of what a non-rotating format will give us. We're like, you're just going to die out of nowhere frequently and are past the point where a patch can really fix that unless you nerf like 20 decks in the non-rotating format, which seems unlikely and at odds with the spirit of wild. I was going to say, I was going to bring up the spirit of the format because I mean, when they created wild was with the first rotation, which was back at old gods a gajillion years ago. And that was basically the original kind of understanding of what wild was going to be was it like an untouched format where they would just let things get crazy and only kind of like patch stuff and even then that kind of came as a philosophy a little later on was like only patch and balance stuff if it was like literally gameplay breaking like if it was actually making infinite loops or like doing super crazy things um, not in terms of power level, but in terms of like actual game mechanics breaking the client. So that's kind of where the original wild format grew out of. But is is that still how people want to play wild today? Like I said, I'm really happy that there are cards, a place that I can go and play whatever cards I want all of the time, but I don't play wild very often. So, I mean, like, it would be really interested, interesting to know of the players who play like me, like how many people who play wild every day actually fall into that. I just want to play with my favorite cards category, or if the people playing day in and day out fall into the competitive bucket and then maybe we should lean more towards what they want. I mean, maybe we should make a new format, <laughs> like curated wild. And, you know, like maybe that's what we need now because we have so many expansions and mini sets and adventures that have rotated out of standard that just sit in this giant pile of cards that is wild. Like maybe we need something that's like, hey, for the next year, this is what the wild format's going to be and pick like eight expansions and be like, you get core and you get these eight expansions and that's it. In what That's what the wild format is, is. That's the curated wild format this year. Wild, the giant crazy bucket still exists, but you know, like that's for like more casual players, you know, like, but the competitive wild format is something else. Like, is is that something that you think they might do? I think they need a middle ground format at this point. Like, this is the 10th year of Hearthstone. Uh, that seems like a good enough time as any to do an in-between something. And I, you still got to leave Old Wild there. Because for the vast majority of players on the casual side, who cares, right? Like, it's they're just playing this deck that they like against other people that are playing this deck that they like. And... If you're listening to this Hearthstone podcast, you are not in this bucket. Like, the vast majority of people are so casual that they do not engage with anything outside the client. And clicking a button where cards don't rotate, like, wild and casual, fundament uh, fundamentally identical. Right? It's fine. Who cares? But something in between with either a smaller pool or, like, or a much more aggressive curation, which I don't think they have the designers for... That's obviously a, a consideration. Yeah. Although they did just, you know, sunset Merc, so <laughs> there's going to be some people looking for a job. <laughs> I would guess most of the Merc's team had been reassigned before this. I'm assuming so, too. Like, <laughs> much before this. And, um, I, and I really shouldn't joke about people's jobs and sunsetting a, a, a mode. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, I mean... I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's... But what are you going to do? It's, uh... They they need more people on the design team. Like, they need more people. And curating wild is a huge task because there's just... It's exponentially more work to keep track of every single interaction. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. I think it's much more likely that they go with something like what you said, where they, like, I would probably find a cutoff point and just say, this is the in-between format. Uh, my idea was always to start at Ashes, because that's when Demon Hunter was introduced, mm. to start post-Demon Hunter. Um, that might be too recent. Maybe you go back one more year to Rise of Shadows or something, but you f like, so maybe you just do five years, five years, like you just find a hard cut. Um, and then you do that forward as an in-between format that's more interesting. Uh, and then you probably, because it's already partial, then you probably do more nerfs, more adjustments there. And you could even do something different as well. You could do something like the last five years of cards and have it be rotating, just slower. Slow-tating. <laughs> so then, well, it would still rotate at the same pace, right? Because it would still be once a year you'd get a rotation, yeah. right? Yeah. It would. Yeah. But then sets would just stay, stay in it for five years instead yes, of yeah. two. Yes, um, yeah. So that could be that could also be something they do, which that limits the issue you run into with every non-rotating format and every card game ever it gets more powerful over time because when you add more cards, it gets more powerful. So by making it larger but still rotating, you mitigate that problem, at mm -hmm. least to a degree. Yeah, and it is kind of interesting because we do have the Demon Hunter problem kind of now-ish and, and eventually we'll have the Death Knight problem, right? Where if you do a, a five-year moving window, eventually... That's going to cut out the expansions where they got their big, you know, set of catch up cards. So, you know, maybe what they need to do is something more along the lines of like Ashes and March are always in wild and everything else is a moving window. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could do something like that. Um, and like... We just need to see what a wild without Genin Baku would look like. Mm -hmm. right? Like, we just need to know what that would look like. And that means some kind of in between format. Um, but yeah, it's maybe there you have an adjusted core set of just some cards that are always there. Um, or maybe you have like a, a, a wild equivalent core set, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're going to talk about it. That's why they're having yeah, this that's... summit. Um, <laughs> We're just having like... our own little mini summit. <laughs> There we go. Alongside it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, chat room, a few people in chat room have pointed out like magic, 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 magic. Obviously, magic has been around for what, 30 years or more at this point. So 30 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've uh, they've kind of dealt with all of these problems already. So I'm sure that there are many uh... magic related solutions. <laughs> Why are you eyeing me? I, I don't know anything about magic, so maybe I am speaking out of my butt. <laughs> They're still dealing with it and are still making formats. As of right now, uh, I count, let's see, eight <laughs> different formats in Magic. Uh, and there are some that have been discontinued, like Extended no longer exists. That was one of my favorites. Um, and some that are online only. Uh, but there are eight different formats with different legality, uh, just in terms of cutting off by like age and platform. And that's not even including things like Popper, which is only commons, or Commander, which is the big social format. Uh, you know, there. I played its own. that one. That's where you get like a big yes. super guy, and and he does stuff. Yes, it's the big super guy <laughs> yeah. format. Yeah. Um, and I they, played it like, like three even... times. <laughs> and Commander just announced they just got their own sub format that they're coming up with now too, pre DH, which is. The, the commander before they started printing cards for commander it's only cards from before that oh my god that's so many things <laughs> there's a lot it's hey when you're around for 30 years you gotta you gotta cater to a bunch of different audiences uh so now chat room is throwing out the idea of commander hearthstone isn't that kind of what we already have though with our heroes kind of sort of it's how long I mean, do you want this episode I was gonna to be? say this is probably very rabbit holy, and we don't necessarily need to do that because we do have some emails and we do have a strategy section. But <laughs> it's so the idea of commander is that you basically have an extra card that always sits in your hand that you build your deck around. Mm -hmm. um, in in Magic, it's you pick someone and it has colors that your deck can correspond to. So imagine if you could pick which classes you got to build a deck with. And they had to match the classes of your commander, that sort of thing. Um, and you can, even when it dies, it goes back to your hand, basically, but it costs more to play each time you play it. And then it has some ability that you build your deck around. Um, they, 
they, I'm sure there will be a point where they try this. Um, I am also sure the tech will will cause some client issues, but like if they make <laughs> it work, it'll be cool. But it's it's also an inherently social format and typically played in groups of four. You can go larger, but typically played you know, like a, a four people to a table. And Hearthstone doesn't have multiplayer like that quite yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'm sure they're working on it among many, many, many other things. I, I'm sure it's the kind of thing that like they they have a special team or room or something at Team 5 where all they do is try to do crazy things like make Hearthstone four player. <laughs> and can we do this without totally destroying the client forever? And so far the answer's been no, but you never know when they're going to crack it. <laughs> yeah. At least I'm, that's what I picture. I'm sure that they have a lab. And we know that in December they do Free Your Mind, which, like, they each get two weeks to work on some project that sometimes actually makes it into the game, sometimes it's something internal. Like, everyone has a couple weeks to just work on something they think would be cool. Um, I mean, like, Battlegrounds was a tavern brawl that they just yeah. said, hey, this is really good, make more. And then they did, and now it's Battlegrounds. Which is still the second most... Oh, I guess that's the the standard snob in me, assuming standard is still the most popular mode. <laughs> it's BGs. It's been BG since BGs. It's, it's, I mean, Joss, it's just cheaper. Like, yeah. Even yeah. though BGs is a great mode, it's just one of them costs somewhere between nothing and fifteen dollars every four months, and the other one costs more. More. So <laughs> yeah. Capital M more. So. Yeah, um, if you guys want to let us know what you think uh, they could do to the wild format, you can always hit us up in our Discord. Uh, but before we get into all of our emails, Hat, you want to talk a little bit about strategy? Yee. Yeah. Uh, talk about some DKs? Hit it very hard. You want to blow something up? <laughs> yeah, <my. laughs> Time to pay! I'm just going to let you introduce this strategy section because I am never going to do a better job than your first bullet point here. So take it away, hat. This deck is the coolest. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I hadn't actually read the show notes until right this second. I was just like, I can't even, I can't. Here. <laughs> wow. It's okay. You were chilling. I was. I was. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Hey, Frosty K, what do we do? Blue stuff. So, when do Frosty we do K, it? Now. <laughs> yes, what do we want? Blue stuff. When do we want it? Now. now. <laughs> so, it's uh, this deck, like, you just kind of do stuff every turn, and your stuff is better than their stuff. So, we cheat a little mana. We have a bunch of stats. We have a bunch of draw. We have a bunch of freeze, and we got a little burn. And we've got a bunch of Discover. So the deck is pretty powerful. Uh, all things considered, it is the best deck in the standard format. It doesn't really have a lot of really bad matchups. So the main thing that you're looking for here is the correct deck list, Joss. Sorry. <laughs> I just guessed. It's I just okay. clicked on Frost Death Knight. <laughs> here, here. I got this. I got this one. Pretty sure I got this deck list. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm new, guys. <laughs> she doesn't even go here. Yeah. God. <laughs> okay. So. There we this go. This list Fixed it. is. The list we have in the show notes is the list that McBanterface used to hit rank one. He's a great streamer, by the way. Go check him out. Twitch.tv slash McBanterface. He also, like, went to Worlds and won a Master's Tour. He's just good at Hearthstone. Um, and, uh. You know, we play, like, all of the murky Frost cards, all the triple rune cards, I think, except for Death Whisper, who we don't play a lot of spells, right? Like, that's the main thing that's different about this deck. Since the printing of Concert Quarter, which really rewards a minion-heavy strategy, a lot of the spells got removed from the deck. This deck only plays six total spells. Two Horn of Winter, two Frost Strike, and two Frostworm's Fury. That's really it. Which... So, Frostworm's Fury, I, I said this to you this afternoon after I was playing this deck. Like, I have 
very often now played four of these in a game, which it, like we knew it was going to be a powerful card when we were first looking at the Death Knight cards. And uh, it, I said at the time it gave me like ultimate infestation vibes. Like you don't have the card draw, but it's so much cheaper. You don't even need it. You do another thing that's super powerful in a minion based format, which is freeze the board. You deal the damage and you get the five five body. And uh, I mean, I have just played these like four of these in a game because you can get them off of uh, Frost Strike. You discover a Frost Rune card and there's not that many in the format right now because we have one expansion and a mini set versus worth of uh, Death Knight cards. So it's a pretty small pool. And I've had usually at least three, if not four in almost all my matches. It's gross. <laughs> And you don't need to go that long, but sometimes you do, and so you can't. Like, that's the thing is... Well, yeah, that's how I win against, game. like, Blood Death Knights, because I did play against a couple of those, and I was just like, it doesn't matter how much health you have and how much you heal, because uh, here's my fourth Frostworm's Fury. <laughs> yeah, you can. Like, it's a thing that you can do. You're good yeah. at all points of the game, right? You're good early game, you have way more stats than you think. Uh, you're good mid game just because you know stats and damage and and board control and you use horn of winter to cheat a little mana, and then uh, and then later in the game you just freeze the board over and over again, do a bunch of burn damage with like mirror manipulator or whatever, uh, and you have Bran and a bunch of discovers and Astalor. And you don't have to play Astalor; it's the worst card in the deck. You can play uh, Might of Menethil, the four two weapon instead if you want to, but. Bran is really good. If you get to turn nine, you just do Bran, School Teacher, Noggling, Noggling. It's really, really powerful to double it all up. You get a ton of value. Uh, Nerubian Vizier, also very helpful for finding more Frostrum series. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we, and even this cheaper. Is this set's Venomous Scorpid. <laughs> yeah, and even Frostrum. cheaper. This is this set's Venomous Scorpid. We've seen it all over the place. Um, and it's much better because the conditional on it to make the spell cost two less is if a friendly undead died either on their turn or this turn. And you know what makes your minions die in your turn is Construct Quarter. So when you play it early, you pop your own minions. You can use it a couple turns later to pop your own minion and then activate Vizier. Much, much easier to get it online. And then when it's online, then you get a 5-mana Frost from Fury or a 0-mana Vampiric Blood or something like that. And both Vizier and Schoolteacher are not bound by rune requirements. So you can just get whatever they show you whatever suits your fancy mm -hmm. at that moment so you can find things like obliterate things like uh anti-magic shell quite nice uh things like the scourge off of vizier if you need another board you can do all sorts of stuff so you end up with a lot of value a lot of damage a lot of stats a lot of board control what are you bad at nothing you're not bad at anything <laughs> Which is the problem with the format right now. <laughs> yes. Yep. That is, that is, this is, like, this is the deck. This is the deck. And there are other things you can do, but this is the deck. Um, so, there are some key cards. The things you want in the mulligans. First of all, the location. Second of all, cards that cost one. Arms Dealer, Bone Breaker, Foul Egg, Skeletal Sidekick. Egg, the best one of these by a large margin. Always keep Egg. If you don't throw it back looking for quarter, just keep it. Promise you want to keep it. And it's okay if you don't end up with the location. You can Frost Strike your own Egg if you have to. You can also use Arms Dealer to buff it, that sort of thing. Uh, but if you sort by Mulligan win rate, there are three cards that are above the median win rate of 60% which is Arms Dealer a little bit, then Quarter and Egg are at the top. Keep the good cards. But your other ones are fine too, and then Harbinger of Winter, the 2-2 two -two that draws a, a Frostbow when it dies. You can keep that if you have a 1 already. I think the, the Mulligan is what I was struggling with the most, and I think it is what you struggle with the most when you're starting with a new deck anyways, is knowing exactly what yeah. to keep. And uh, yeah, so I wasn't 100% sure, and I was just kind of like keeping anything because, you know, HS Replay, when you have their um, their app running in the background, gives you that handy-dandy little pop-up in the bottom right corner where it's like, hey, what should I keep? And it's like their Mulligan helper, so I just kept anything that was green, not realizing how ridiculously powerful the construct quarter in and a one mana card was specifically the egg because again like when i first saw it 
I assumed it was transforming my minion. And I'm like, I'm a death knight. I don't want to do that. I want my minions to die. So I get corpses. I want, you know, my death rattles to actually go off. So I was like, this is dumb. Why would I ever, why would I use this? And then when I, when you told me how it actually works, I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. That is ridiculous. And then, so then I changed up my mulligan strategy and was looking a lot more aggressively for construct quarter. Um, and just keeping whatever one man as I had, but I think I need to be keeping eggs, but throwing everything else. <laughs> I think you keep the one drops generally, like arms dealer is definitely worth keeping, but even sidekick or bone breaker are totally fine to have. Um, they're still pretty high in the mulligan win rate. Like it's below the average of the deck because the deck is so crazy. Mm. But if you look at even skeletal sidekick by itself is a 59.6% mulligan win rate, like that is low only relative to the rest of the deck. But well, I was we take say, yeah, the, the worst possible card you can have is Frostworm's Fury, and even that's at 53%. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, don't keep Frostworm's Fury. No, don't but keep also, it. But <laughs> also, if you end up with it, in, but if you end up with the seven mana card in your mulligan, you still win more than half the time. Yeah. <laughs> Seems good. Um, so... When do I want to use Horns of Winter? Because I feel like I'm used to playing Frost DK with all of the spell synergy where it was a lot more, you know, specific trying to do combo-y things using Horns. But I, I feel like they just sit in my hand because I'm so afraid of wasting them. But I think maybe I should be a little more proactive. Yeah, like uh, just play stuff. <laughs> right it's something that i'll do a lot if i have turn one it, my turn was a bone breaker or whatever uh turn two if i can do like coin quarter horn harbinger right i coin at the location and i play horn of winter for two mana and i play the harbinger the two two and get my four or five online right away totally worth it 100 percent worth it right if you can play a school teacher and then horn of winter at the noggling and a skeletal sidekick go ahead you want to use this between like turn turns two through like five ish if you can, or the turn you play Frigidar if you draw it, if you can get any kind of real incremental advantage out of it. You're not really holding it for anything. We're a minion based, board based aggro deck. We're just really good at being on the board and off the board. But if you have something you can do with your Horn of Winter, it's probably worth doing. Like, don't horn hero power. Please don't do that. <laughs> unless you're going to activate a contract quarter. I was just saying, uh, I've definitely but... horned hero powered once. And that was with um, the the dude on the board that when you summon... Um, oh, arms dealer. Arms sure. dealer. Yeah. With arms dealer on the board, I've horned hero power to clear something off the other side to protect my arms dealer. I've definitely done that. <laughs> Sure, that's totally fine, right? Okay. It, it's doing something. <laughs> it, that is that is a backstab, right? That's zero mana deal two yeah. damage. We take those, right? That's absolutely fine. And it's also worth noting, by the way, with the location and your hero power, your hero power token doesn't die until at the end of the turn. It doesn't die after you attack with it. So if you hero power and you're going to quarter it, attack face first, it's free. There's no reason not to. Don't be afraid to attack with your minions before you eat them with the location. Um, and that includes your hero power token. So yeah, and that's really it for the mulligans. I mean, in terms of your early development, like your early game, you're just looking to get numbers on the board. Again, you really, really want quarter, but otherwise just develop, play your stuff. It's okay. Play your stuff on curve. Um, don't be afraid to tempo brain if you have him, because if you tempo brain, he sticks, then you can play any number of things. School teacher is great. The Sarian, totally fine. Um, even like a skeletal sidekick is a bunch of damage. And then a vizier is a, bu is a bunch of spells. And Vizier works fine, even if it's not active. Like, it still gets you spells, they're just not reduced. So, don't be afraid to tempo out the brand. Um, when you get into the mid-game, if you have the corpses, you want to play Marrow if the board is empty, and you want to play Frigidar or Fury if the board is full. That's kind of the paradigm. Marrow Manipulator, it shoots five two-damage missiles, assuming you have five corpses. If they don't have any minions in play, that's a Pyroblast. You like that. You take those. You With a 5-5 five, five body. Yes, pretty good. But if they have a bunch of crap in play, then those missiles are a lot less reliable. You might not kill things. Your 5-5 five, five might get traded into or might not be all that valuable. You might not go face. So that's where you lean into either Frigidar or you save for Frostworm's Fury to keep the board locked up. 
And so they're kind of serving different purposes. Like, you know, if you have nothing else to do on six and they have a couple two twos and, and you can go face with the mirror manipulator, like, go ahead and play it. Don't hold it. We're not the kind of deck that is looking to go long. We can, but we're not looking for that. But if you have the option, choose Manipulator Frigidara against a white forty. Frigidara is much better. Yeah. Yeah. How's this lined up with your experience so far? You got to play some of this today. I did, yeah. And it's it's been pretty much... Uh, I mean, I've definitely made the Manipulator play on a board of stuff that only has one or two health to try to get rid of it and... I don't know. I, I, the Joss luck was not with me today. <laughs> Cause there, I mean, there's kind of two ways to look at it, right? Like it didn't kill the minions cause it went face. So thumbs up, but also it didn't kill the minions. So not great, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, they are, they're definitely unpredictable. And like you say, it, it allows them to then potentially make trades and stuff. But even if the minions don't die, then you have, usually by that point in the game a frostworm fury to follow up with whether it's through an earlier discover or drawn out of your deck so i mean i if i didn't kill the opposing board it was still kind of okay because then i just froze the opposing board so <laughs> kind of worked out both Solid. ways yeah <laughs> like i i didn't really find a time when i played marrow manipulator and then subsequently lost the game <laughs> so strong card yeah. Strong card with the Frostworm Sphere to follow up. If you couldn't freeze the board that she was unable to kill, then that would not be great. <laughs> yeah, and that's where you can... So the way that you primarily lose with this deck is if you fall behind early and then your freeze doesn't stop their damage. So you really have to find a way if you're against this deck. After about turn six, you better win off board because your minions aren't going to be able to attack for yeah. much of the time. Uh, <laughs> so you really, really want to find a way to win off board. Like, that's where I found success with the Undead Shadow Priest, because you're playing minions that deal damage when they die early, and you want them to die. And then after they freeze your stuff, then you finish it off with damage from hands, with spells like Shadow Word on Death and whatever, and Void Touch Attendant to, to boost the damage. And that's where I found some success there. Um, but if you're trying to win with a board-based strategy, like Unholy, for example, where you're hoping to make a bunch of minions then play Grave Strength, your full board is going to keep you from doing anything because it's all going to be locked up. And so this is where Frostrum's Fury, when your minions were really small and you couldn't get in the early chip damage before, that was where like it had to be a glacial advance chain before the nerfs to kill you. Now, like, you're just doing pressure all game long with these giant, like, with these wild pondles, these four or five rushers that kind of come out of nowhere. And so Frostrum's Fury is much harder to keep up with because of the six turns of prior pressure. Yeah, overall, I mean, like I said off the top of the show, um, it, it is a really powerful deck because even without knowing the construct kind of interaction and that that's what I was aiming for, and I mean, I don't think I drew construct quarter for my first five or six games with this deck <laughs> so like i hadn't even experienced the crazy combo and yet i was still winning most of my games um without having any idea how the deck was supposed to function so i think it is it's quite a powerful deck right now there are a lot of kind of powerful combinations of things you can put together, a lot of synergies in this deck that are going to get you there. And uh, even when you have no idea what you're doing, you can win. So this is all obviously like a big outlier right now. And and like we, we said earlier on, we're probably looking at a balance patch sometime in the next like five to seven days. So definitely uh, if you want to try this deck, try it right now because it's good against everything bad against basically nothing and has decent matchups against the the counters so i mean if, if you even want to call them counters <laughs> yeah i don't think this is quite as egregious as day one demon hunter but it's in the conversation but it reminds me more of one night in karazhan mid-range shaman for those of you old timers if we're doing a back in my day um it's uh because that deck was, it went really long, and it always beat you on the board, and it had too much stats for not enough mana. But also, most importantly, sometimes it would just be Trog Golem, and you would die on turn five. Yeah. That happens sometimes. <laughs> so it's, this is like, it's a mid-range deck with busted openers, 
as opposed to something like aggro dh which is an aggro deck that just like put out way too much damage way too fast this is a little bit slower than that except for the games when it isn't i wonder why i hated demon hunter so much <laughs> and this doesn't bother me <laughs> Well, because this is this is not quite as crazy opening. Like the the first few turns are not the same. There's no altruist razor storm bullshit, like <laughs> which was completely too much. Uh, and also keep in mind, like Demon Hunter did come out during the first month of COVID lockdown, and none of us were doing okay. <laughs> I guess so. And yeah, I was. I was in a mood. We were all in a mood. <laughs> it wasn't the best association for a lot of folks. And the fears around day one De Demon Hunter were significant, and then they all turned out to be true, as opposed to day one Death Knight, which was pretty mediocre. Mm. And then they just they gave a little nudge, and they gave another nudge, and they pulled something else back, and they gave a little nudge. And now, like, we don't have that initial connection with the class of being super busted. And also, it's not really killing you from hand. It's mostly with things on the board. I think it's As probably it's to, probably the day yeah. one thing. It's like um, Death Knights were new, like you say, and the power level wasn't quite there. And so I'm I'm more happy now that this new hotness is really playable and viable. And it's like now I feel like I get to have the fun with the new thing that I didn't necessarily get to have like a month or two ago. So I think maybe that's why I'm a little bit more open to it. Like if Demon Hunter had, had a similar launch where it wasn't very good the first few weeks and then they kind of like bumped it even if they bumped it too far up to the point where of power level that it was on day one i think i would have been more open to that because then i'm like oh good this is actually good now now i can kind of play with like it gives you a chance to like acclimatize to it like i don't ask yeah. me mentally what is different between something being op day one or op six weeks down the road i don't know my brain is messed up okay <laughs> but it's like i well, was not okay with it with demon hunter but death knight is fine <laughs> you go be op <laughs> illidan's kind of just an edgy d-bag right well, like, that's just, true too yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know arthas he's just cooler <sighs> I should have seen that coming. That one's on me. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, should we uh, take some emails here and wrap up the show? I'm ready when you are. Hello. Hello. It's me. Hello. Um, just quickly, did you get my message? Yep. Oh. Hello, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You can send your emails to tacpodcast at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter or send us messages in our patron Discord questions channel like King Duplass did. He said, to me, it seems that at this time of year in Hearthstone, a lot of the community just can't wait until rotation, either to have cards leave or to have a more open or weaker meta. The situation hasn't been helped by Kazakhstan's launch state last year and then this year's Evolve Shaman Madness. Do you think there's anything Team 5 can do to try to make that February and March period before rotation more enjoyable and less aggra aggravating for those folks? Not really. <laughs> like, I would say, like, the the mini set is the newest thing that they do, right? Is giving us new cards in the new year. It used to be we'd get our expansion at the end of the previous year, and then we'd have a really long time between the expansion and the rotation. And it was um, it was a lot of time with usually the most powerful meta because it had the most cards in it. So, you know, things would get um, really powerful and really frustrating really quickly. And so, I mean, I think the mini set is the is the answer. And maybe they just haven't quite hit the right mini set yet. <laughs> OK. I have an answer. OK. That. <laughs> I need to clarify, I am not being paid by Blizzard, I am not a shill, blah, 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 but... Um, <laughs> what are you about to say? <laughs> I don't think mini sets are working. No? So, remember what I said, the best patches. Six weeks in, and then they kill it with the mini set, mm. and then we wait for the mini set to get fixed, and then they, the last month we're waiting for the pre-order, so they don't change anything. So it's just this month at the end where we do where none of us play because we're just kind of 
waiting for something else to happen. So you're not fixing the stale meta, you're deferring it a little bit. But how many times has the mini set in the last expansion made people want to play a lot more? Darkmoon Races was cool because the expansion itself was kind of mediocre, and the mini set saved it. It had a lot of really cool and interesting and powerful cards. The last two mini sets, Kazaka Sans Lair and this one, have brought along, I think, some issues. Even though they have some cool cards, they brought along more issues, more problems than they've solved. So I think what you need to do is move to four sets a year. Now, hmm. I hope that they rein in the prices. <laughs> I am not being paid by Blizzard. I would like for them to be proportionally smaller and proportionally costed differently. But if a set lasted three months instead of four, and we got that six-week balance patch and then kept it for six weeks, the best one, we kept it for six weeks, and three weeks into it, we got preview season. That would be cool. That would be better. It makes each different point in the calendar much more compelling. It makes the metas, they're still brief, but they're not quite as churny as they were before. And theoretically, this is the part that's really optimistic. Theoretically, they bring the price of the smaller expansions down because <laughs> there are more of them. I understand. That's funny. Ha ha. I said a funny yeah. thing. That capitalism will reward the consumer. <laughs> yeah. For some Remember reason. Argentina hat. <laughs> it's, so I recognize that this in reality, in the reality that we live in, if this ever happened, it probably makes the game more expensive. It doesn't have to. You can cut the mini sets out and that's take that $45 in, in profit that you're going to make by buying it three times a year, slice it up, add it to the fourth set, take a little bit off each of the other ones, like make them $70 mega bundle instead of 80 and do four of them instead of three, right? It's an extra 40 bucks a year. But then you take off the 45 from the main set. Perfect. There you go. $70 instead of $80 for the mega bundle, right? Like 40 instead of instead of 50 for the small bundle, whatever. Like something like that. The finance people can figure it out. It might make the game more expensive, but I can tell you that is a much better cadence because I hate, hate, hate. Good patch, two weeks later, mini set, two weeks later, fix mini set, then a month of waiting. It feels so jam-packed into the small period where everything changes. I can't keep track of anything. And the only time that it's good when I get used to it, they take it away twice. Mm. Yeah, I know we have talked about like the churn um, a couple of times, I feel like in the past couple of years where it feels like it's really hard to keep up with standard where, you know, you just kind of start to get settled and understand what's going on. And again, this is from a more like casual player standpoint, obviously competitive players on ladder hours and hours and hours a day don't necessarily have that issue. But I think for a more casual player, more casual audience, it's a lot to keep up with. And especially if you're looking at, you know, nerf patches and buff patches and then mini sets and expansions and everything else, like it, it was a lot, a lot to keep up with. And, you know, the decks that you were playing were suddenly no good. And, you know, like there were very few, like obviously there were some examples, like I think Pirate Warrior, you could play for like four expansions in a row and it was no big deal and it didn't change much and it was still decent. Um but I think overall, it, it was a really, really hard cadence to keep up with. And uh, I think that maybe um, even if they like, I, even if they rolled the mini set into the main set <laughs> and did the, even kept it at three a year, like, I think I'd be fine with that as well. Like, I'm I'm glad I'm not the only one that feel like I was so shocked to hear you say it, because I feel like of all of the people that I know you live in the Hearthstone world more than anybody else <laughs> and like keep up and play every day. And, you know, so if even you don't like the mini set, I'm like, oh, I thought it was just me. I thought I was the only one who didn't like the mini sets. So it's kind of it's good to hear that, like, I'm not alone. And even somebody keeping up with Hearthstone, maybe for different reasons. But, you know, like it just seems like maybe the mini sets aren't doing the thing that they wanted the mini sets to do. The mini sets exacerbate the waiting period of like that feeling that we that we've had for most of this past standard year of I'm waiting for this to get fixed mm -hmm. because you got the two weeks after the set comes out like I like the initial two week discovery period even when there's something that's a little broken like it's usually like at least fun and interesting and Nathra in particular was a great example of there were seven really well balanced classes and then three dead classes and those seven classes were really interesting to play against each other but if you want to play the other three if you want to play paladin demon hunter or warrior you didn't have anything so yeah they buffed it but then they accidentally shot too high and they buffed rogue and edwin <laughs> was at three mana 
for three and a half weeks when we knew the second we played with him that it was problematic. Three and a half weeks, we're waiting for that to get fixed. Okay, two and a half weeks later, they put out the mini set. And two weeks after that, they got to fix it. And then we're like, so we're waiting for Edwin to get fixed. Okay, they fix it. Then the mini set comes out. Okay, we're waiting for the mini set to get fixed. And then at that point, we're waiting for the next expansion. So just giving us more time with the good part, which is about six weeks in, solves a lot of these problems. And so like, imagine expansion, two weeks in, you get the, the quick patch. A month after that, you get the good patch. And then three weeks into the remaining six weeks, you get your pre-order and your new card, your Renathal, your Okani, whatever, along with maybe a couple balance tweaks if you're feeling them, right? And so you have two weeks, four weeks, three weeks, three weeks, instead of two weeks, four weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. It's just better. And it minimized that feeling of, okay, I'm waiting for them to fix this. Yep. I, I I just I like the I like the idea of getting rid of the mini sets period. I think like that would like you say obviously yeah. King Duplass's question is very specifically about this time of year post rotate or uh, pre rotation. But I think yeah. that which I don't mind by the way. Yeah, it's this <laughs> is this is the the summer vacation of Hearthstone that we're going into, where the period between the announcement of of the rotation set and the new year, the new Hearthstone year. You, you you go away, like, you get your summer job, and you go, like, whatever. It's like a coming-of-age movie sort of thing in the summer. Um, and, like, so I go play other games. I catch up on things that I haven't had the time for. I usually go play, like, some open-world 40-something-hour game or more that I wouldn't have time for any other point of the year. I started um, Witcher 3. Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that'll take you 170 hours. Yeah. <laughs> like, Ghost of Tsushima is, was perfect for this time last year, I think. Um, so... And then, like, you come back in April when they do rotation, like, you see all your high school friends in the hallways, like, hey, how you doing? Hey, I haven't seen you forever. Like, and you're just, everyone gets back to it. I like that period. I don't think there's a problem with that feeling. But it happens three times a year. Don't like that. Mm. Well, hopefully they're listening. And next year, maybe one of the surprises we see in the roadmap will be no uh. mini set. <laughs> do you want to take our, our next and final question? Yes. You very subtly alluded to it. Kilmar not asked any wild speculations about what surprise we may see in the roadmap for the new year. Um, not mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had a look at this year's roadmap and it's, um, there aren't a lot of surprises, period. I mean, like, like you say, like mercenaries won't be on the roadmap anymore. I think uh, when they revealed the roadmap, there were only two spell locked things on the roadmap uh, kind of this time last year. One of those we know was DK. I can't even remember what the summer spell locked thing was. Um, but basically, it's like uh, tavern brawls, expansion, mini set, battlegrounds. Like it's, it's all the stuff that we know <laughs> there wasn't anything kind of crazy. There were no big changes, which I think is something, um, I think Ixar had basically talked about, um, way back after mercenaries launched to kind of saying like, we're done with modes for now. You know, we just launched BGs. We just launched Mercs. Like that's enough. The client's full. Let's chill for a bit. And, you know, we had a chill year. I don't really see them giving us anything crazy next year. Like, I think this is going to be another year like 2022 was, you know, like, I don't think we're going to see anything crazy. Do you think that there's any anything crazy coming down the pipe? Like, maybe I think not like this coming standard year, but the one after my big crazy speculation would be monks, right? Like, we know that, or we think that they're coming, or another class is coming, potentially. But, um, yeah, I would say this is, like, not the coming year, but the year after. So, I don't know. I don't think anything crazy is coming next year. So, the summer stuff, I think, was the Bee Gees pass, the Bee Gees track, along with quests. Oh, uh, um, okay. Yeah. So I think that's big enough to be more than just like the battlegrounds bubble. Like it was a pretty significant change. Um, also, it could have been forty card decks. Like who knows? The this past <laughs> year was they added so many features. They added so mm. much stuff, quality of life stuff, and features, and like being able to share a deck in client in a way that that is functional. 
is awesome. Like, that's really nice. Um, and they've done so many things like that where the client just works better and mm -hmm. does more and has more stuff for me. So I imagine it's going to be more about sustainability and refinement, but also this is the year the merger is supposed to go through. Right. Uh, yeah, I expect it to be a leaner year in terms of hiring more people to add stuff. Mm. Um, it's going to be very much about like, hey, we have our headcount. And let's keep the thing running. And I imagine it's going to be I hadn't even thought of pretty that. straightforward. Yeah. I like they're not gonna get headcount. And if the merger does go through, it's gonna be pretty disruptive to their operation. Um, so I think it's gonna be about holding on for dear life and keeping keeping the the train rolling down the tracks more than anything. So yeah, I'd be surprised they had a lot of big stuff planned. Yeah, that's definitely fair. So I think, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe we'll see mini sets leave on top of the uh, mercenaries icons leaving too. But uh, yeah, overall, I think we're in for a pretty quiet year in Hearthstone and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, for the most part, it's, it's working, right? Like they're selling packs at seven times. <laughs> okay, I promise. I Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. stop. I'll stop. stop. <laughs> Let's call it. Listen, I don't want a quiet year. I want a stable year. Stable. <laughs> yeah, stable. That's that's a good. Let's go yeah. with the word stable because I would love it if Hearthstone just like they announced their set and there was just no Wall Street Journal article to go with it about some horrible thing that had gone down that day at the office. I would love if they they launch a set and there is no game breaking bug. Like and I don't even care that there are cards that are a little too good when they launch. Like, that is called card games. That yeah, happens that's in every fine. card game forever <laughs> until the end of time. Like, it, sure, I would like it if some of this stuff was a little bit pulled back. But, like, that is that is, we're not talking about gameplay here. We're talking about functionality and stability and the health of the team. I hope the designers themselves, who are in perhaps the most embattled work environment that I can think of right now. And I worked for a movie theater chain during COVID. And this is <laughs> worse. Uh, like... I hope they find a way to find some of their own piece and keep making cool stuff with not enough people on the team. I'll go ahead and say that. So I think they all work twice as hard as they should have to to bring us this game with the amount of resources available. Yep, I think all that's fair. So uh, yeah, on, on that note, we're done. That's it. We're 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 done. That's it. Yay! <laughs> End of show. I'm obviously fading. So tired. <laughs> but we do want to say another thank you to our epic patrons. Thank you guys so much for supporting us over at Patreon.com/tack. Remember, becoming a tack patron gives you access to our Discord as well as other perks. Also, a big thank you to our Patreon producers, Dustin C and Jarrett F. You can follow the show on Twitter at TAC Podcast and catch the live show on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash jossplays. And do not miss next week. It is episode 500. We have a very special guest. We are going to be joined by Ms. Cora, who has not been on the show since before she joined the Blizzard team. So I am so excited for this interview. Like I am just through the roof because she is an amazing person. She's had a great career in Hearthstone, both in and out of Blizzard, and I can't wait to talk to her. I'm so stoked. <laughs> she's, I mean, she's, she is the Cora. Yes. Right? The, the Cora. The Cora. So, <laughs> yes. We're very excited to talk to her. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I forget what her title is now. Isn't she like Queen of Hearthstone or something? I think that is legit her actual title. I mean, every time I look, it just it changes. And, that, and that's part of what I'm looking forward to talking to her about, because I feel like she just got into Team 5 and then just went up and up and up and up. And I love it. I love it. <laughs> She's a very, very yeah. smart person and she loves the game. So I'm just so excited to talk to her. Yeah, it'll be great. Yeah, it'll be right here. It will be at at twitch.theangrychicken.com where you can find us. Joss, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch. I'm at Joss Plays. That's J-O-C-E Plays. You can also find me on my general gaming podcast, which is called The Gamers In. Go check it out. Um, we've been talking about all kinds of stuff lately. Um, and obviously, Witcher 3, which is totally new to me. So you guys can have a little bit of nostalgia there back to 2015 when all the rest of you played it and listen to me talk about Witcher 3 for the first time. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun over there. Go check it out if you haven't. Hat, where can folks find you? 
You can find me thanking our producers, Dustin C. and Jarrett F. I already did I don't that. Think... Okay, good. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I'll edit this out. I'll fix it in post. Listen, I'm just, I'm just making sure. Just making sure. You know what? I'm leaving that in. Dustin C. and Jared, if you deserve thanks, not it's twice, true. but now this is thrice. Yeah. Thrice. You get three times the thanks. Uh, and you can find me. The hub of my content is on the functional website, twitter.com slash ridiculous hat. Um, I also have two other Hearthstone podcasts. Coin Concede, we make the competitive side of the game more accessible to you. And Vicious Syndicate, we take a data-driven look at the high-level legend metagame. Uh, but yeah. But that's going to do it. Joss is back. Joss, you know what we say? Is it... Job's done. Job's done. Yeah. Feels good. We did it. We did a show. <laughs> we did a show. I felt so rusty. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's fine. You talked good. Thanks. You did the good talk. <laughs> oh, man. Dad, thanks for being here. Yeah, you guys were awesome. You must be. I saw you all. You Thank you all now. for all the subs through the uh, through the show. That was awesome. You guys are great. <laughs> oh God, I'm so tired. <laughs> I don't think right, I haven't everyone. been like up past ten in weeks. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Well, I am beat. <laughs> that we're gonna bring the stream down yeah. so that Joss can can write up the blog and then go go lay herself down and watch some more TVs. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys all for being here. You have been awesome, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week right here for episode 500. I'm so stoked for Cora. So yeah, see you guys then. Bye. Yay. Bye. <laughs>